very happy and pleased to welcome and present um, to all of us this morning, uh, Frank Kovacs, uh, one of the co-founders and our current president of the Breakfast Club New Jersey. So good morning, Frank. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Breakfast Club. The Breakfast Club was founded following 9-11 to help those that have lost their jobs due to the tragedy. Uh, over the years, you know, there's been many other reasons uh, to keep the group going with strategic sourcing impacts, with uh, impacts of financial and economic conditions in the country, and most recently, unfortunately, due to COVID. Uh, all of these uh, major items have consistently had uh, impact on job loss and the need for people to adapt in their employment uh, searches. Uh, digital has also been a very significant impact in, you know, changing the way, you know, having to do upskilling, reskilling, including de-skilling, where, you know, certain ways that work used to be done, you know, just aren't applicable or the best way to approach it, you know, in the current times, given the impact of the new technologies. So um, what we try and do is from a job search and a career management perspective, have a very uh, widely accepted topic uh, that would be applicable to all of our members, whether they're alumni or they're here in job search for the first time. And with that, we've helped you know literally thousands of people over the years in uh, landing their new opportunities. Uh, today's a great day because we have a speaker who's been associated with the group for many years. I don't want to steal the thunder and you know introduce myself, but I'm very much looking forward to the presentation. And what I would suggest to each one of you, especially if you're new, is take advantage to all the different uh, items that the Breakfast Club has to offer. Uh, we have a email, which is uh, the Breakfast Club NJ at groups.io. And through that, if you send an email to that from the email that you join the group on, uh, that will uh, allow you to communicate with everybody. We do ask that that be restricted to anything that's job search or career management specific. Uh, it's a great way to go out there and tap our whole group. If you're uh, targeting a company, looking for contacts there, somebody that knows somebody there that could help you understand the culture, understand, you know, how levels and compensation work at the group, at the targeted company. And sometimes you can even leverage that to get a introduction right into a hiring manager. And the number one way you land a job is to get a personal referral right into the hiring manager. In addition to that, we have a LinkedIn group uh, shortly after joining the Breakfast Club NJ. You should get a uh, invite from Haresh Kaswani from our group that manages our LinkedIn presence. And again, that's a great way to grow your network. Uh, we also have a meetup as well as our group website. And the meetup is a very important item to um, specify that you're going to be attending or intend to attend the meeting so that you know, we understand who's going to be here. And then following the group, the Meetup uh, site will send you a list of all the people that had registered. Sometimes we'll remember a face, sometimes we'll remember a name and want to follow up with somebody. You know, Having that is a, a very good way to uh, assist you in being able to connect with uh, fellow group members after the meeting. I did receive a couple inquiries as to uh, when you know, we would return to brick and mortar and in-person meetings. Uh, there, uh, the issue is, is the hotel uh, and the individual who used to manage uh, the meeting space there have both changed over. Uh, within the new contract, they're not as liberal of canceling dates. You know, they, uh, they wanna charge you even if the meeting's not held. And I don't know if people saw the uh, article in the Washington Post from last weekend, but basically they published a article that was projecting in the fall and winter 
that the U.S. Uh, may face as many as 100 million infections from COVID. So as it's a, a pretty costly endeavor of $450 a month, you know, I wouldn't want to sit there and commit us and, and put us at risk from having to cancel the meetings, pay for the room, even if we're not there. So we're going to take the cautious route and keep the meetings virtual uh, for the foreseeable future to see how that turns out. And then uh, with each of you and your employment, you know, it's very critical from a business resiliency standpoint. Uh, the U.S. is now one of the most vaxxed and, and boosted countries in the world. But with 100 million uh, people getting infected here, you can only imagine what the, the impact's going to be outside of the U.S. where they don't have that similar level of protection. So, you know, we want to keep our members safe. And then above and beyond that, when you return to brick and mortar, you know, people have different preferences. Some people prefer masks. Some people don't prefer masks. Some people may feel comfortable shaking hands, which is, you know, a gesture that many do when they meet in a networking situation. Some innocently also want to exchange cards. So, you know, all of that's going to have to be figured out and how we specify who has what preferences, you know, just for a simple thing like putting people in a room. Uh, the other thing is, is many limitations are still there for social distancing. So, you know, you get a bunch of people that show up and they show up for an eight o'clock in the morning meeting. Some may have traveled an hour to get there. And, you know, the limits on how many attendees can be in a room are strictly enforced. So I'd hate to be turning people away, you know, if, if the restrictions are so onerous that, you know, we really can't support people that are showing up. So we continue to watch. We continue to work through everything. I hope that, you know, in the near future, there is a turnaround related to uh, the infection rate going down and, you know, new strains not coming out. But, you know, until that happens, uh, we'll remain virtual. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn the program over to uh, Jerry Payton to introduce our speaker. And again, you know, Jerry and David run our uh, meeting and speaker uh, team for the Breakfast Club. They do an excellent job. So if ever you have anyone you want to recommend, you know, that you've enjoyed in the past or seen in another venue that you think would be very good for the Breakfast Club, just let them know. I'm sure they would be very appreciative of help. Or if anybody wants to join any of the committees, you know, David and Jerry do the presentation. Adrian runs a Facebook and Meetup. You know, we've had a lot of people for a lot of years that have been kind enough to contribute their time and really help out the uh, Breakfast Club. So if you'd like to volunteer to help, you know, I'm sure they'd welcome it and uh, just let any of us know. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Frank. Good morning, everyone. Well, we have an excellent program for you today, and let me introduce today's speaker. Uh, John Hadley helps job seekers who are frustrated with their search. He also works with professionals struggling to become and be seen as influential leaders in their organizations. After graduating from Stanford University, John worked in the financial services industry for 25 years in roles ranging from product manager to chief actuary. He then opened a successful systems consulting practice, which generated over $2.5 million in revenues. In 2003, he started a career search counseling business and helped hundreds of professionals land uh, the job and pay they deserve. John is a popular speaker and author on career and career search topics. I now like to introduce John Hadley. John? Thanks, Jerry. So uh, let me share my screen. Um, let's see. And let me find the, the right. Okay, uh, if, if I did it correctly, you should be seeing the first slide in the presentation. Okay. So Tom came to me when he'd had 15 months of a steady stream of job interviews and never a single offer. A week after my winning interviews program, he was weighing two competitive job offers and one of them was higher than the range he understood the company even had to offer. 
So we're hoping that today we can help you all make some progress towards that sort of result. So we're gonna talk about how to turn interviews into offers. So to start with, I'd just like to hear what everyone thinks are the biggest challenges that they face in the interview process so we can make sure we're hitting the right points this morning. So you can unmute yourself, you can put a note in the chat box, whatever you're comfortable with, um, but tell us what are the biggest challenges that you're facing? Anyone? I guess to, I probably have to open the chat box to see what people put, don't I? Yep, so for those of you who uh, don't know, and here's my flashcard again, the chat is a little icon in the upper right corner. It's a circle with a tab. And we do suggest you write your message to everyone. You have a choice of who to send it to, not just to John or to me or to Jerry or Frank. This way, all of us have the opportunity to read it. So yeah, put your comment there or just open your mic as per John's invitation. Okay, how to connect with the interviewer. We're definitely going to talk about that. I'm just writing these down as we go, so I have the same list. Anyone else? What, what, other, what other challenges are you facing? Making sure I don't ramble. Sorry? Making sure I don't ramble. Ah, sure keeping, right. keeping it concise. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good, good one. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll, I'll just expand on, on that, um, how to connect. I think, you know, Alex helped me a lot, but I was struggling turning my interviews to offers when I was in transition. And that level of connection it's a lot of it is thinking on your feet. So, you know, you do your research and find out about them, but it goes deeper than that. You know, it's it's the body language, it's the tone of voice, it's whether it's on video or not. So it's a combination of all of that that I struggled with and as along with, you know, talking a little too long, tell me about yourself. Yep. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot to think about. Which is part of the reason that uh, of preparing so well and and then practicing so that so that you aren't so stuck in oh what's what's my answer to this specific question but you're you're so well prepared that you can think at that higher level but they are that's that's a difficult issue um, yeah. where you see answering where you see yourself in five years. Do people still ask that? That's, inter that's interesting. I haven't had anyone ask me about the answer to that for a long time. So I was wondering if people, if interviewers are still asking that very much. Anyone else, any other challenges? Okay. So it, it looks like Nancy's trying to say something, but her mic still isn't working. So sorry, Nancy. Oh, okay. <laughs> Understanding the company's pain, okay. And being able to communicate your value, right? I know I could count on Alex to put something in there. All right, so why don't so we'll move on. People can add to the list as as we go. Um, so here's the agenda I had in mind for today. Um, really, oh, and I see Nancy trying to get across to the interviewer how my transferable skills will relate to the position. Okay, that's yeah, this telling your story, communicating your value, yeah, um, all kind of connected there. So to really understand what to do in the interview and how to turn it into an offer you, you really need to look at the critical interview stages so we're at first so we're going to go through that and use that as a context we're going to talk a little bit about um how to look at things 
from the interviewer's perspective and then lead that into a discussion, the inter influential conversation, um, and if there's time, a little bit about tension management. So, um, and uh, you know, at the end, I, I do have a link where people can sign up for career tips, and I've, I've created a series called Building Influence that um, it's been getting a lot of positive uh, feedback from people. It's you know one short email per day for about two weeks on creating influence in meetings and interviews. And so anyone who signs up for career tips today, I'll, I'll send you that series as well. Or if you're already on my list, feel free to just drop me a note saying you'd like to get the series and I'll be happy to send it to you. Uh, so the critical interview stages, I, I like to break it down this way. I mean, you're trying to hit a homer. So I came up with the homer template. And these are the five stages of the, of the interview. Um, so let's break them down. So the first is the homework stage. This is you know, everything that takes place before you get to the interview. And really, this is all about confidence. You know, the more preparation you do, the more confidence you come into that interview with. And confidence is really key to the whole process, the whole job search process and to the interview. In fact, um, Kevin came to me early in my practice and he had been out for two full years and his confidence was there was none left. He, he was ready to take a $30,000 pay cut if he could just get in the door somewhere and it wasn't happening anywhere. And so he'd really withdrawn into himself. And, the, and so we put a lot of work into rebuilding his confidence, getting him back to seeing the value he offered, ha having talking points that would resonate with people, getting him really believing in himself again and what it was that he brought to the table. And very quickly, that got him back to um, back into the game. And in fact, his confidence grew to where in that in that interview, he was he'd been ready to take a $30,000 pay cut. But he had enough confidence that he even applied a little technique I showed him that got them to raise the starting salary $10,000. So confidence just carries through everything you do in the interview process and the entire job search process. So here's some of the things you, you, you do to prepare. And, uh, you know, obviously they're all the things you do before you ever have your first interview. You know, you've got to make sure your resume is really good. You've got to have cover let a way of approaching cover letters is they're really marketing letters. You need your LinkedIn profile to be one that really engages and attracts people, leaves them wanting to know more. You need a really good marketing message. You've got to practice your stories that you're going to tell and your answers. And, and like someone was saying, it's of the struggle of sometimes talking too long. Well, this is where you get them sharp and concise, results oriented, never longer than a minute. You work on, particularly nowadays, where so much is being done by GoToMeeting or Zooms or Microsoft Teams, you need to work on making sure your video presence is top notch, that your lighting is good, your connection quality is good, your mic is good, all, all of those sorts of things, because there's going to be a lot of remote work no matter what you do. Um, it, you know, some places will be fully in, in person, but most places are going to have at least some part that's hybrid if not remote. And so people are going to be judging what they're seeing in the and experiencing in that remote session as what they're going to be experiencing working with you day by day. So if that's not a crystal clear connection and good experience for them, they're thinking, this is what I'm going to have to put up with every day. And, and even when people are back fully in person in certain places, there are probably still going to be a lot of interviews that take place remotely. 
because it's just so convenient now that we've cracked that code for everyone. So, so a lot of interviewers are going to do that. Maybe they'll bring you in for the last round. Um, and then, as Alex would certainly say, that you, you, know, you need to do a lot of practice. You need to do role play. You need to get comfortable with questions being asked at you different ways than you anticipated in different order and so on. So the best way is to do a lot of practice. And then before every interview, you're going to do your specific preparation. You're going to research the company. You're going to research the opening. You're going to research the interviewers. And by the way, if you don't get an interview schedule, that's a pretty big red flag right there. Um, I would be I would be pushing for that before I would agree to go in for an interview. And then you're going to think about the specific questions and answers that might be relevant to that interview. What are the three to five stories that I think are going to be so powerful that for this particular interview, and I want to make sure that I bring these ones up during the course of the interview. And of course, you're going to think about you know appearance as well. So we don't need to spend a lot more time on, on preparation, but that's what you're going to do before you ever get to the interview. So now we get to the opening of the interview. And the opening is all about making a great first impression. So um, this, depending on whether it's in person or remote, I mean, you may, you may have the handshake if it's in person. Of course, you, there in person, you also have to think about, as, as Frank was saying, people have different thresholds for what they're comfortable with. So you've got to think ahead of time. What am I going to do if I walk into this place? You know, first, am I comfortable shaking hands? Am I comfortable being unmasked? But also, what am I going to do depending on what the interviewer or the company, what their policy is? What am I going to do if I walk into uh, this person's office and they say, oh, you know, we can take off our masks now. Am I comfortable doing that? So you got to think about these things ahead of time so you're prepared for how you're going to deal with them professionally without creating a huge disconnect suddenly because you're, you're, you're reacting on the spot. And then you want to, um, and as Valerie says, you know, maybe you can look into their protocols. I would definitely do that before I went in for an in-person interview. Um, but even if they have protocols, you know, not everyone honors them to the same degree. So again, you still have to think about what, you know, what do I do if. Um, but the key is that you're trying to exude this quiet confidence that you would be a great candidate for them. And then you're trying to see, you know, what do I have in common with this person, which hopefully you you may have found some things from your research ahead of time, but you're looking for a way to create some agreement from the start, find some things in common. And then you're trying to set the stage properly. You draw a picture of what it is that you bring to the table that that gets the other person saying, instead of them spending the next 10 minutes trying to draw their own picture, and it may not look at all like what you intended, you've gotten your chance to give your opening salvo and draw it for them. So there's like, they can relax a little bit and they say, oh, okay, I kind of get what Joe is all about. So now they're more validating than trying to draw. And if you want a, a template for that, just go to my website, and um, enter hero in the search bar. And there are several articles related to coming up with your hero story. So what I thought might be, might be fun to do is, is there someone who would like to do just a quick, you know, one minute practice of the opening with me? Um, and David, since I'm sharing, I guess I don't see I don't see anyone's camera while I'm sharing, unless I guess I have to. You can change yeah if you, where near where you see the um, chat, it may be a oh. little text that says "View Everyone." You can change that to "View Active Cameras." It might say just "View Presenter." 
And view, oh, there. Okay, they're back. Click on that. Change it to view active cameras. I wasn't seeing that. Okay, so active cameras, and you'll see the people with cameras yeah, on. I am seeing. Them. Thank you. So, is there someone who would like to volunteer to do a, a quick uh, role play with me, and we'll just yeah, you know, just play with this a little bit. Yeah, and if the camera's not on and you want to raise your hand, just put your name in chat. You know, I'll volunteer, and we'll check that as well. Because this is this is how you get the the most value from any of this is actually practicing the techniques. This is really easy. We get stuck in our head with, te okay, here's the story I'm going to tell. Here's how I'm going to do it. And so it's when you actually practice it that you say, oh, now I see what I need to improve on. I, I had someone year a few years ago who he was actually a pretty good um, interviewer. And I, I said to him, let's do a little role play. He's like, well, you know, I don't know if I need that, but okay. And so we did this role play. And at the end of the session, he was like, oh my God, I saw all the, all the nuances that I really need to improve on. When can we do another role play? So, okay. Who, so who would like to volunteer? Okay. Francesco. Francesco. Yep. So, okay. So Francesco. So the setup is that you're you're interviewing for I don't know what job it is and that's okay. You're interviewing for your dream job. We're and and this is the very start of the interview. Um, and so okay, so we'll see. Oh, uh, Francesco, thanks for waiting. I, I'm I'm sorry I'm a little bit late. Had to, I had to take the cat to the vet. But um, so why don't you tell me uh, tell me why you're here. Oh, your your mic is your mic is uh is muted. There. So what what is the job more or less? Or it's whatever what? whatever job you want it to be is what you're interviewing for. So oh, okay, so okay. Your chance to kind of tell your story. So let's let's start again. Okay. So let's start again. So no, so, don't worry. Okay. So Fran Francesco, I, I'm I'm sorry I'm late. You know, I had I had to take the cat to the vet. So um. So why don't you tell me your story? Why why are you here? So I want to boost my career and I love to work with your company and work on this, uh, let's see, machine learning uh, um, research and uh, development. And I'm a creative person, so I think I can give a big contribution to you and uh, I, think that your company can give the best opportunity for me to to shine and to contribute and to uh, you know to create the next big thing in the field okay so what what feedback would anyone have for francesco and what he could do to improve on that any thoughts a question for me or for the audience? For, for the group in general. Uh, well, if you, if you think there's something you, you should improve on, you feel free to you know, provide your own critique too. Yeah. <laughs> but I would have, I would have tried to connect on the cat to the vet. On the yeah. Yeah. And it, that was an effect, it was a test. Uh, and, <laughs> and it's not, it, you know, this happens all the time. I, I say when I do this, at least half the time, no one picks up on it because we're so nervous. We're, we're, it's an interview. I'm here to tell my story. They've asked me a question. I've got to answer. But this is part of that finding things in common, building that relationship. So, so the very first thing would have that would have been really powerful is say, "Oh, I, I'm so sorry." I'm so sorry about that. And and we might end up having a long conversation about that. Or it might just be, uh, no, everything's fine and we move on. But I'll, but I'll also see you as someone who's empathetic and that you, you know, you're, you're not just all business. So, so that would be the first thing. How about the, now, how about the story itself? What do you think? Um, a couple of things struck me. The very first, I think it was, I think it was the very first thing you said was how you're here to boost your career. And so right away, you're, it comes across that I'm all about myself, not about what I can do for the company. Now, I am, as an interviewer, I am very interested in 
your career growth and where you're going in the long in the long run. But um, I, but you got to get me excited about what you can do for us first before I care about that. So I wouldn't I wouldn't make the start about that. I might make the very end of the story. In fact, that that hero template that I mentioned uh, talks about at the very end finishing with the objective I am going for. Um, but yeah, that one, and, and, you, and you said something about, I can, I can make a big contribution, but it was still very gen, gen, uh, generic. You want it to be really specific. Here's the sort of contribution I can make for you. Give me, give me a specific example of the sort of result you might provide or sort of challenge you might solve for us. And that would really engage me a lot more. Um, yeah, you were, now part of it is the artificial nature of, of the role play, but you, you want to get into the, the, the mindset of what's my story that I'm going to tell? What are the things that will really engage this person? What are the the key results I want to get across the table and weave those into that story you would tell at the beginning that just right from the start draws me in and I see, yeah, he's, he's, he's bringing the sorts of things that would be really interesting to us. Does that make sense? Is that helpful? Yes, yes, it is. And as Don's saying, understand their pain points, which is, you know, you do that research to try and make your best uh, insights into what their pain points might be, and then use the story, use the everything in the interview to try to dig into those a lot, a lot more deeply. Okay, so that's that's what the open. And by the way, in terms of you know seeking agreement and that sort of thing, yeah, just you know if you were coming in in person. You, you would look around the room, you try to get a sense of the person from what you see. On Zoom, it's a little harder, but you know, you or go to a meeting, but you look around the room and see, is there something I can that attracts my attention? Like someone who, who happened to notice that little frisbee disc or the book about frisbee in the back might might say something about frisbee. And that was my sport in high school. We, you know, ultimate frisbee started at my high school, and I was, you know, one of the first maybe fifty players of the game back when it first started, and took it out to started it on the West Coast. So anyone who noticed that and brought that up, I mean, we'd be off to the races in terms of rapport right from the start. So you look for anything like that. So so let's move on to. The middle of the interview and you know I call this all that jazz because I, I had a, a client um, who he kept saying okay what's the script what's the script for the interview and we had kind of a loose script for how the beginning would start and we had a loose script well a much actually a pretty defined script for the end of the interview but the middle yeah, he kept he kept saying, "Well, what's the script? Where? What is it?" And he finally said, "Oh, I get it. It's jazz. There is no script. It's improvisation. It's responding to what is going on. This is where if you are really well prepared, you've got all your stories, you've got them down, you you've thought about which ones are the the key ones you want to make sure to bring up, and you know your strategy." Now you're thinking at a different level and you are, you're thinking about why is the interviewer asking this? Where, is, where are they going? What can I do to, to really highlight the things I wanna highlight? So you're, you're thinking at a different level here, but here's where things come in differently than you anticipated. People ask questions, using different wording than you anticipated and you don't recognize it as the question that you had prepared for. So this is where you're, you're really kind of, you're improvising, you're responding to everything. In fact, um, for that things coming in different ways than you think, um, I used to run a group called the Career Networking Group up in Basking Ridge. 
And well, Alex may remember this time where we, what we did was, um, I did a presentation on just a few aspects of the interview and had mini role plays. And I, I had had little sheets of paper prepared ahead of time. And so I taught everyone the hero story con concept. And then I had them break into, into pairs, actually pair into groups of three so that they could each try. And I said, take a slip of paper out. And you, one of you is the interviewer, take that slip of paper and ask the question. And the questions were all different forms of how someone might ask the, you to tell your story. And so I was going around the room and listening to what people were doing. And at this one table, the person didn't tell their, their hero story that we had just worked on. And I said, uh, I'm confused. Tell me, why didn't you tell your story? And this person said, well, because that wasn't the question they asked me. So they were really hung up in the very specific wording of the question and didn't see it as the opportunity to tell their story. Because I think the variation that person got was, tell me why you're here. Well, someone asked you that, it's very easy to say, well, to, to explain that, I need to tell you a little bit about my story. And then you can tell your story and then you can finish it up with the very direct answer to, and that's why I'm here because I think I can do X, Y, Z for your company. So, so you, you know, you, you try in this not to get trapped into too literal thinking of everything that's going on, but why is, this going this way? What can I do to get things going in the right direction? What, what is the interview thinking of? How can I respond to that? All of that. And so that's the jazz in the middle. So the core of the middle of the interview, is you're trying to have a really influential conversation with someone. So this is, you're trying to build rapport. You're trying to turn this from you know, kind of sterile Q and A session into a real conversation where you're not just answering their questions, you're asking your own question. And, and by the way, don't make the rookie mistake of saving your questions for the end. If we've had a really good conversation and you've asked me a lot of really good questions throughout the interview, I could care less if you have any additional questions at the end, because we've had a good conversation, you've asked me that. But a lot of people get trapped in this, this thinking of, I've got to have this zinger for when they ask me if I have any more questions. I've got to have something really good to ask there. But in fact, um, if you save that zinger for the end, it actually can work against you. Because what happens is we've had this really, hopefully we've had this really good discussion. Um, we get to the end, I say, well, do you have any other questions? And you ask me this zinger and I'm sitting there, you think, ah, I've just nailed it. I've asked this great question. He's gonna be so impressed. And I'm sitting there saying, well, this would have been a really good question to ask 10 minutes ago when we had a lot of time. There's not much time to even deal with this. Does he even realize that this was a good question? It, does he have a problem with prioritization of he's asking this at the very end when we have no time? So while you think you're asking something that's gonna really impress me, it's likely that you're actually putting in my head all of these things that make me now question you. And as Don said, yeah, that's a great question. I start on Monday, right? Uh, in fact, I, someone um, I was working with, he had a panel interview and it was going really well. It did everything, you know, the interaction was really good. And at the end they, they said, okay, so do you have any other questions? I said, yeah, I just have one. When do I start? And he got the offer. So yeah, there's, so don't worry about saving questions for the end. Worry about 
having questions throughout that turn this into a great conversation. And most importantly, dig as deeply into the challenges they have as you possibly can, which means you need to ask the right questions. You have to ask the sort of questions that dig into those challenges. Any questions on this? Any questions, observations? Anyone want to challenge me on any of this? That's, that's fine too. So um, if you have any questions, either unmute yourself or put them in the chat box, or if you have additional observations you want to make. But uh, this is where, as Don says, you understand their pain points. This is where you're getting into those pain points. This is where you're, you're working really hard to unearth them and to stir them up. So, um, in fact, is, why, don't we, why don't we try again? Is there anyone who would like to do a, a, a quick role play on, on something in the middle of the interview? I don't have a role play, but how do you know you're asking the right questions? Like you said, ask the right questions. Like, how do I know I'm asking the right questions? Well, initially, almost anything is a good question because it's just getting the conversation going. So initially, you said you, what you want to do is say, make a kind of a, a mental check list that every second or third question that I answer. I finish my with my own question and I make them related to what they've just asked me. For for example, um, they they asked me about my my project management experience. I tell them this great story about what I did as a project manager, and at the end I can do something like so. You know, I'm I'm very curious. You know, I mentioned how I apply this, this, and this. How do you use that in your operation? So I can, you know, relate it to what I did. So early on, it's that sort of thing. But as it gets further along, the right questions are ones that, that get first to the goals that they have, the goals for the job, the goals for the operation, and then the challenges behind those. What's going on? What's, what's happening in this operation? How can I really dig into the issues that they face? Because that, you know, that's the core of the interview. That's where the hiring decision is, down at what's keeping us up all night. So the questions that lead you to the things that are keeping us up at night, those are the most important ones to get to. Does that help? And anyone else? Anyone want to add someone? Go this ahead. is an opportunity to, to speak with a coach and get some uh, insightful uh, review of a discussion point you may have. So please take advantage of John's offer. Yeah, I think, um, you know, this is one of the areas that I struggled with. And asking the right questions is it's a lot of work. And you've got to know when you're thinking on your feet who you're speaking to. So one of my big mistakes was I was asking the recruiter or the screening person questions that they couldn't answer. And they kept saying, oh, the hiring manager. So I, it took me a while to get to say, who am I speaking with? Um, when you put a recruiter on the spot and ask something that he or she doesn't know, they sometimes feel a little defensive. So I had to tone that down and say, I'm gonna ask certain questions to a phone screen or my first interview with the recruiter, then I had to ask different, more strategic questions about that company and the position to the hiring manager. So yeah, I had to break my questions down because you know I'm excited, I wanna know so much about the opportunity, but if you ask questions to somebody who doesn't know the answer, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't set the right tone. Yeah, Joseph, that's a really good point. And, and we're actually going to get into a little bit of that when it, in the interviewer's perspective later on, that, yeah, it's very important that I understand who I'm talking to. What, what, are, what are their possible pain points? What are the things they're worried about? Not just, you know, what's the company's issues or what, you know, 
because you're right. The, that that HR rep doesn't know um, doesn't really know the details of the job. They you can't talk to the technical aspects. They can't talk to the things, but they can talk to the culture. That's something that's very important to them. So you th so you want to think about what's important to this particular interviewer. And then, and Alex suggests you ask questions to which you already have the answer, which is is true. Except, I think you you want to dig way deeper beyond what you know. You want to dig as deep into their challenges as you possibly can. And you until you get in there, you have some idea, but you can't know what's keeping them up at at night, why is it keeping them up at night, how is it affecting all the parts of the operation, that sort of thing. And that's the sort of question that will really get to where you're going to get hired when you're talking about those things that that most candidates don't get into, actually, with them. So, okay, so let's move on to the end of the interview. Um, so, the end of the interview is all about leaving nothing to chance because you've you know hopefully you've done all all the right things but you want to know and so there are three things that i believe you have to do at the end of the interview if you want this to be the best result you can. And by the way, Joe, you know, that, that's a good observation, Joe, about asking what their management style is. Um, and you can, you know, you can also get at some of that simply by asking people, you know, what do you like best about the operation? You know, what do you what do you like best about your job? How do you like, you know, how do you like the company? What, you know, what if you had to um, define how the company operates well how would you define it you know those sorts of questions that that get them to share without it being so you know like when i say what's the company culture like eh, i'm not gonna it's it's i'm not gonna get a very insightful question but when i ask how the culture affects that person i'm gonna get a lot more insightful answer I asked so, that question to a subordinate at one interview and he hemmed and hawed a little bit and then finally came out and said that the hiring manager was a micromanager. Mm -hmm. so I struck gold. Yeah, yeah, there you can. Know. You don't know what you're going to get. Another interview, which was a panel one, just audio online, the hiring manager said, well, it, I don't know if you'd be working for me, so it's not fair to answer it. He was evasive on my questions, and it told me a lot, too. Yep. Oh, that, and that, that's really key, that all, throughout the interview, you're listening and watching for any red flags, because, you know, you're trying to, you want to be evaluating them as much as they're evaluating you. You want to be deciding is this the place I want to work? Are these the sorts of challenges I even want to get involved in? So so what are the three things? What do you think the three things are that you have to do at the end of the interview if you want this to have been successful? Any thoughts? You need to state how excited you are about the opportunity and that you really would like to work there. Right, you need in effect ask for the job or some variation of that because nothing is more um, disturbing to the the hiring manager than having a what a really good candidate and being concerned about whether they really want the job because I've got to go through a lot of work to um, come up with the offer get it approved to through HR or with my boss, get every, everything in place. I don't want to do that if I'm not sure that the person is the person, I, if they're really interested. So if I have two candidates who are relatively close and one I am convinced really wants this job and the other I'm not so sure, I'm always going to make the offer to the one who I'm convinced wants it. 
So, so it's really key to make sure that that's known. And um, someone else mentioned um, about knowing the next steps and asked the question, if I don't hear from you in X weeks, may I give you a call? Good, you're hitting the right points. Let's see if we can refine it a little bit. Um, so yeah, first, you, before you do anything else, you gotta find out how you did. You don't, you don't leave that to chance, even if you think it went really well. And so, so your first job is to uncover and then answer any objections there might be. So now a lot of, you'll, you'll see a lot written, a lot of coaches have said, oh, ask something like, um, so is there anything that would prevent you from hiring? Horrible question. Never, ever ask that question. You want it. You want to uncover this in a positive way. You don't want to encourage me to go dig deep and come up with reasons not to hire you. So the way I like to do it is something along the lines of, is there anything else I could tell you that would show you I'm the candidate you might want to hire for this job? So I'm asking in a positive way, and then I'm observing how their reaction to see, is there anything I need to try to uncover that they're not sharing? And then, as we mentioned, to ask for the job. And I could build those two together, say, you know, based on our conversation, I am really convinced I can do X, Y, and Z for you. I'm, and I'm really interested. But can I ask you, is there anything else I could tell you that would help you, you know, see if I'm the right candidate or whatever way I want to do it. And then I want to take charge. As someone was saying, find out the, the next steps, find out the timeline for the next steps, and then, at, then, then create your own action step. Now, I would, I would create it a little more um, firmly. You know, the one person suggested you know, asking, saying, well, uh, can, I call, can I call you in two weeks or can I follow up? Don't ask, tell them you will. Show your professionalism, show the way you operate, that you have the confidence here. So I would, they tell me that, well, we're looking at a couple more candidates. We hope to make a decision by the end of next week. I'm gonna say, great. Then I will plan to call you a week from Monday if I haven't heard from you by then. Now, they might say, well, no, in, don't call us then, wait another week. They might say, don't call us, call the HR person. They might say, um, they might say, no, we'll call you. So I will respect what they um, come back with, but I want to make sure that I put it on, and and I would not ask I Joe uh, Joseph. I don't know that I would ask them when a good time to follow up is. I would I would present. Here's when I plan to let them come back to say, well, no, that's that's a bad time. Well, you know, can you do it another time? Because I'm trying to show them that I am very professional. I'm organized. This is the way I do business, and I'm. I'm getting a chance to demonstrate a quality that might make it more likely I get hired. Plus, um, there, there's a real psychological aspect to this. I'm always getting people saying that, um, well, what um, I haven't heard from them for a week or two weeks or three weeks. When should I follow up? And the first thing I say is, well, when did you tell them you were going to follow up? So you get into the psychology of, I'm worried, I haven't heard from them, when am I gonna do this? And this way, you're able to just go home, mark your calendar for a week from Monday, because that's what you said you were gonna do, and you don't have to worry about it anymore. You know what, what you're gonna do, when you're gonna do it. And when a week from Monday comes, and I haven't heard from them, I'm able to call, leave a very professional voicemail if I don't get them in person, say, Jim, I'm just following up on the, the product management position we spoke about. I am really interested and I'd like to check on the status. I will plan to call you again on Wednesday if I haven't heard from you by then. You can reach me in the meanwhile at 908-725-2437. So I get a chance to show them the way I operate again and I'm showing them that I 
do what I said I'll do when I said I'll do it. So I'm again demonstrating a quality that might make it more likely I get hired. Um, then, so that's basically how you want to end the interview really well. And then, of course, it's a resale. And as Valerie was suggesting, you know, sending out a thank you with a personal touch, using something from the conversation we had that shows that I was carefully listening to what you said. That's always a, a very important point. So in the resale, you just you're trying to keep the interviewer excited. So you send a thank you note every time and to everyone you met with. You don't just send a thank you though, you use it to resell yourself. You point out some of the key points as to why you'd be a great candidate based on our conversation. You bring that personal touch in, hey, I hope your cat's doing better. You know, all those things that, that will make me more interested in hiring you. And then you make sure to demonstrate your professionalism, your organization, your passion, your proactivity. You use a, have your keep in touch strategy for what am I gonna do? You know, suppose this stretches out a little bit. What am I gonna say in my next message? What can I do? Is there some resource I can provide? Is there something I can say that, um, well, I never told them about this. Let me give them an example. Are there things I can do other than just continually calling and saying, I'm just following up again? I had a colleague who, um, he had an interview and they actually had multiple openings and they were considering him for several of them, but there was one in particular he was very interested in and he hadn't heard from the hiring manager for lately. So we caucused on what to do and he, he called her and said, I'm, I'm just following up to see, is there anything else I can provide you that would show you that I might be the candidate that you wanna hire? And he got an immediate call back from her saying, I, I'm so sorry we haven't been in touch. That's because we were just trying to figure out which position you were the best fit for, but you can expect an offer tomorrow. So, you, you know, you, you want to make sure you do the right things to resell yourself. So, and you want to make sure you prep your references. Don't let me, if I'm one of your references, don't let me be caught by surprise by a call from some company about you because I can be much more helpful to you if I know what you've interviewed for, what sort of challenges they're facing, what things based on the conversation you had with them, you think will be the most important things to emphasize. You wanna prep your references every time. So let's look a little bit uh, at the interviewer's perspective because we were talking about that a little bit earlier. So um think about every particular interviewer that you're going to you're going to meet with what are their concerns and how do they vary for the executive recruiter uh, external recruiter the hr gatekeeper the hiring manager the potential peer the hiring manager's boss they all have different concerns they all have different challenges that are keeping them up. So the more you focus on their specific concerns, the more influence you will create, the more you will create internal advocates. I mean, the peer can be, the peer is concerned about, is this person going to be a helpmate? Is this going to be someone who makes my job easier? Are they going to make my job more difficult? Are they going to be competition for the next level up? You know, all these things that's going through their mind. So you think about what are the stories I can tell? What are the questions I can ask about collaboration, about, you know, working together and, you know, in, in a really coordinated way? When I'm talking to the HR person, well, talking about the all the details of the job, it's not the right person to talk about that with. 
but they're very concerned about the right fit to the company. So this is the best person to talk to about the culture and its infusion. I could ask them, what, you know, what attracted you to the company? What do you like most about the way the company operates? You know, how, tell, you, know you can get into all sorts of things around company culture and fit that you might not care to spend as much time with, with someone else. And now you're talking about the things that they want to hear. So, so what that tells you about how to conduct yourself in those interviews is that you want to address each interviewer's own concerns. You want to tell different stories or you want to modify them. When I'm talking to the CFO, I'm going to emphasize the financial aspects of my stories. When I'm talking to the marketing person, I'm going to emphasize the marketing aspects of my stories. I might tell the same story, but have a different focus, a different variation, different points that I emphasize depending on who I'm talking to. I'm going to bring up different aspects of my background that are more relevant to that person. I'm going to explore different issues. I'm going to focus on different challenges. I'm basically, I'm going to build relationships individually because they are individuals. So let's quickly get into the influential conversation and tension management. Um, so I'm trying to keep this to basically around an hour and then we can do more question and answer if people want after that. So the influential conversation in general, my, the goal that as I see it is to help the other person succeed by producing a solution that best meets their needs. That's how you have true influence with someone when you come in with that attitude. So when you take that to the interview, the variation uh, there is to help the hiring manager succeed by providing a solution that best meets the hiring manager's needs and also having the confidence to walk away if you aren't or don't want to be that solution. If you come in with this attitude, if you come in, if this comes through, you will create a lot of influence with me. You will be, you know, you're, you're focused on what helps me the most. And that's the point here. You're here to get hired. If on the other hand, if all your focus is just on selling yourself, how will you come across? You won't come across as genuine. Now, a lot of coaches will tell you, hey, there's nothing to do until you get the offer. You, you're here, you, you go for the offer no matter what. I don't believe in that. I, partly, there's a bad psychology associated with that. Because I can sense as the hiring manager that you're here just to sell yourself. You're just trying to get the offer. And then I'm not sure I am getting a clear picture of what you really are. I'm, because you, you're just trying to sell me. Um, but the other thing is that if you get to a place in the interview where it's very clear to you that this is the wrong fit, or this is not the sort of challenge you want to deal with, it's not the role you want, you actually will gain a lot of credibility with me. You'll be, you know, have a much better relationship with me if you admit it at that point. Say, look, yeah, John, based on our conversation, I just, have, I just have to tell you that I don't think this is the right job for me. I'll appreciate your honesty. And in fact, I've, I've had people do that once in a while in an interview. It didn't, it didn't end the interview. We had a good discussion about what they really wanted and explored whether there might be another fit for them. So it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't automatically rule you out, but you're playing the long game. You're playing the relationship. You're playing the chance that I still get really impressed with you and maybe connect you to someone else in the company, another hiring manager who might have the role that fits you. Or I've actually had uh, at least one client who the interviewer said, you know, let me connect you to one of our clients who I think could use someone like you. So last part, you know, 
real quick, I want to get a little bit into tension management because this is something that people don't tend to think about. But this is really critical. People pay attention to wherever they find their tension. You know, if you if you are if you've completely mastered something, you don't pay you don't have any tension about it. You don't tend to pay much attention to it. So you you know you want to find a way to manage the tension that's going on around the interview. So you need to observe and manage this interviewer's tension to have true influence with them. So you need to observe their body language, you need to observe their expressions, you need to see their emotional reaction to things, any distractions that are going on, and then you need to react to all of those clues appropriately. You know, if, if I'm interviewing with someone, they're yawning and they're like, they're sitting back and they're looking at, around the room. There's something wrong here. And I need to bring their attention back to me. So I need to react to that. On the other hand, if they're like, they're like with me, they're smiling, they're, they're getting really engaged. I'm going in the right direction. I need to keep going in that direction. Even if it's not the direction necessarily that I had in mind because I've got the engagement, I'm, fo I'm building the relationship. If I build a really strong relationship with and a lot of engagement, I'll get the chance to get into the things that might, that I feel will get me hired. But if I don't have the engagement, it doesn't matter if I get into them because I've lost the, the relationship side. So there are two types of tension to think about in the interview. There's relationship tension, the uh, between the inter dynamics between me and the interviewer. And I want to reduce that. I want this person to be really comfortable with me. And there's the hiring or buying tension. I want them to be really engaged, you know, have a lot of tension. I gotta get this person on my team. I gotta hire them. I gotta find a spot for them. So I want to enhance that. That's the stirring up the pain aspect. And if you want some more on this, again, go to my website, type tension in the search bar, and you'll find a number of articles on, on building tension, tension in the interviews, that sort of thing that, that you can read up on. So if you think about the relationship tension, you know, who has tension about the relationship when you first walk into an interview with someone you haven't met? before. Now, obviously you do because you're trying to get hired, but doesn't that hiring manager have a lot of tension too? Now, why? Why do you think they have tension? What, what, what reasons do you think this, this hiring manager might have some tension? I mean, the obvious one is, well, they don't know you. Um, and yeah, am I going to like you and that sort of thing? But what what do you think? What why do why does the interviewer have tension at the start? Their boss wants them to make the right decision and yes, not uh, drag it on and et cetera. Yeah, I I want to make the right decision. I want to get someone on board so I don't have to you know be working overtime trying to deal with all these issues myself. My boss wants to see me get the right person. And I'm worried that if I get the wrong person, my boss is going to know I don't make good hiring decisions. So getting the wrong person is something that could impact my career at the company. I want to be known as someone who builds a good team, who hires the right people. So there are always these reasons, all these, all these things going through the interviewer's head that raise the relationship tension at the beginning. So, so your focus is on what can I do? How can I build this engagement and get this person seeing me as the one they want to hire? Because that relationship tension creates stress. It creates a concentration on motives instead of the content of what you're saying. It, there's low trust until we have some, some engagement and we get that tension down. There's no free flow of information and it colors how I hear what you're saying. So everything you can do to 
kind of bring that down to get me just, I, I like you. I, I, I see you as someone who'd be a really good fit with my team. Now the stress goes down, the trust goes up, the I'm more hearing what you're saying and hearing it the way you want me to hear it. So all the things we said about the proper opening are keys to reducing that relationship tension. I'm trying to do that right at the start. So the rest of the interview can focus on building the tension about hiring me to the place where you've got to take action and make me the offer. So on the hiring tension side, you know that you want to increase it by stirring up the pain, by digging deep into the challenges, and by being the solution instead of pro instead of providing the solution. That's the avoiding the free consulting game. Um, I get another thing you could go to my website. I've I've written a number of articles on on interviews or free consulting. If you type in um, free consulting or some variation on that in the search bar, you'll, you'll get um, a number of articles related to that. So as I mentioned at the beginning, if you um, sign up for career tips, I put that out every month with a lot of advice for marketing yourself for a search. Uh, I'll I'll also send you my Building Influence series. It's one short email a day, um, each workday for about two weeks. So you can go to that link and sign up for Career Tips and I'll, I'll send you the Building Influence series as well. Or if you're already on my Career Tips newsletter and you'd like to get the series, just drop me a note and I will be happy to send you that series. And I'm also doing, uh, free webinar on Wednesday, Five Secrets to Landing a Job You'll Love. So feel free to uh, sign up and check that out. Um, that's what I wanted to share today. So I'm happy to take any additional questions anyone has for as long as David wants to keep going. Because I know, it, you know we planned this for, to be about an hour and I think, I think we've hit the mark there. Yeah, well, I'm still awake. I'm enjoying this. So um, <laughs> as, as much as everyone else is, uh, folks, if you want to put a question in chat, you're welcome to. If you want to just quickly unmute your microphone to have an opportunity to speak with John, please do so. We've got plenty of time. I had a question about thank you notes. I, In the past, I'd always sent a physical letter uh, for a thank you note, but I guess some people now do it by email. But to me, that seems like it's almost taking the easy way, quick and dirty way out uh, what's what do you recommend well it, it this is going to be context sensitive according to the place um i actually do prefer the the written um thank you note uh, actually I, I prefer it as a business letter because you're getting a chance to show me you can write a professional business letter um if you're worried, one of the reasons people do email is they're worried it's not going to get there in time. So if you're worried, you could send something by email and then send the letter as a follow up. Or you could put you could always do it um, overnight mail if you want. But I think you have you have depending on the place, you have more potential to stand out with the letter because we all get tons and tons of emails and so it just kind of it can easily get buried in the pile i think sending a letter also shows that you're willing to put the effort into the whole process of typing the letter and putting it in the envelope and going to the post office all those minor things but yeah it's, and and it's and especially as we were talking earlier if you, if you do it if you use some cursive in it <laughs> Well, just, I don't think so, that's going to work for me. Yeah, no. yeah, that would not work for me either, except for even the signature. They they need a translator to understand that. So, John, the only the only problem with handwritten letters in a COVID world is if they're not in the office, you're not going to get the letter. No, the, the, um, I think everyone still gets their their office mail. It just may take them 
uh, you know, an extra day or two. But, uh, you know, companies are pretty good about, you know, getting things to people. So it just might take, you know, a little bit longer. Hey, John, I, I wondered uh, what you think about uh, taking uh, interviews that may not be right the, the the particular kind of job or the particular company that you're interested in. Because why? Well, it depends on why are you taking that interview. Is that because you want practice? It is, uh, but I thought the point you made about uh, letting people see you for other roles was particularly of interest. Uh, I'm keeping a landed list and there's easily a dozen people on that list who've gotten jobs that were created for them. Right. Oh, well, that, yeah, that's, yes. And um, that's really the networking that, that does that the best. I might, it, I don't want to go in for an interview for so, for something that I have no interest in. One, it's a waste of my time. And two, it's a waste of the interviewer's time. So if they get at all any sense that this is not what I'm interested in, that I'm just, I'm just practicing, I'm going to actually burn the relationship. But if it's something I truly might be interested in, absolutely, that's fine. And maybe in the course of the conversation, we find a fit for something better. But I'm going to go for one-on-one -on -one conversations with people, meetings with people um, outside of what I'm specifically going for. That's really the the network where I say, hey, you know, you're you're in an interesting field, you're in an interesting interesting company or an interesting role, whatever it might be. And I'd, I'd, I'd love to chat with you. I'd love to get your perspectives on my search. And, I, and I'll have those deeper conversations with people. And that can lead to someone saying, you know, there might be something here. We might be able to create something, whatever. Thanks. Hey, John, I want to make a comment. First of all, so nice to see you again. And I can assure everybody here that nobody has seen you and heard you more than i have that, and that's i still like it <laughs> i still like it john john one thing you did not mention is this the interview doesn't happen in vacuum uh it, the background is the economic climate right now the demand is very very high and i'll give you an example two weeks ago my daughter called me in panic Dad, I need two people. I need to hire them very fast. We have the product. We have people ordering, willing to pay, nobody to deliver. I need two people fast. And I don't have applicants. So I reached out to my friend, uh, Christine Dykman. I, I, some of you know her. And she advertised the opening. She received 20 applicants. She interviewed four. She hired two and everything happened within a week. Mm -hmm. So again, right now, the demand for people is very, very high. And now it's the time for people to apply. If the market flips over, this is over. Uh, they will be very, very picky. Yeah, it's true. Now, Alicia commented that in today's world, a professional letter is via email, and I, I would question that. It is, it, it, there is a lot being done by email. That doesn't make an email a professional letter. I could always, the other thing I could do is send an email and have a professional letter as a PDF attachment to that email, potentially. Um, but I'm trying to show that I can communicate in a very professional way. But again, it depends on the culture, you know, the, you know, so that's part of what I'm going to try to assess during the interview. What sort of culture is this? You know, thought before uh, I had on the interview retention, you know, they, they may be have that tension because now they're asked, being asked to spend, let's say, two hours reviewing your resume and interviewing you, providing feedback afterwards to 
their boss or to um, you know anyone else that needs it, and that's two hours worth of work that they're not getting done that they have to do. Absolutely, yeah. I I I don't want to be inter mo well. Most interviewers do not want to be spending their time interviewing. That's that's they want to be getting the job done. They want to so. That's a really good point. Um, I want this to be over. And I'm, so I'm not going to bring you in for an interview just for chuckles. I'm going to bring you in for an interview because I think there's a, there's a reasonable chance you might be the person I want to hire. So you're coming in from a place, you, you should always think you're coming in from a place of a little bit of power there that you, there's a reason they've invited me in because they're not going to waste their time interviewing just for the sake of interview. Well, <clears throat> I'm also wondering, you know, you asked the question, you know, what might the interviewer be nervous about, <clears throat> you know, and picking up on your point just now, the interviewer may also be nervous that they don't know how to interview well. And so they're wasting their time or, or whatever. And we need oh, to yeah. be aware, maybe that was your point about taking charge, that uh, we need to control our presentation of the message. Yeah, very, very few interviewers, in my experience, have ever had any interview training. We, are, we're just, we, we were managers and we were just asked to interview people. And, you know, I, I got my, what interview training I had was on the job from like chatting with the head of HR who was a friend and said, and getting tech ideas on techniques or reading books. They, they didn't have courses on how to interview. And I was, I was doing all the actuarial hiring for my company for 13 years. So, um, so I got good at it. But then again, a lot of interviewers don't get good at it because they don't get feedback on their interview skills. They just assume that they're good judges of character and they know what to do. And they may not. And, and I, as an interviewer, am really going to appreciate the candidate who makes it really easy for me to see what they bring to the table and to evaluate them and, and creates this good conversation. So I have a, a real re feel like I have a real relationship with them. So, folks, before we wrap up, any uh, more questions for John? stories to share and by the way we're gonna end the meeting of course in a few minutes there's no urgency that's right now but when we do we're going to keep the session open with the recording off so we can chit chat a little bit everyone's welcome to stay around as long as you're able it's like hanging around the, <clears throat> the hotel meeting room for a little while afterwards but uh, while john is here and and we have his attention anything else going once going twice Hello, uh, my name is Kevin Kosage. My question is about calling back the um, hiring manager a week after the interview. Um, could this cause the hiring manager to get too many phone calls or how many times should you call back in a week, a month, you know, two weeks? Um, well, me calling them in a week is certainly not too many. But um, I think the key is I make sure they know what I'm going to do and when I'm going to do it. So I call them, you know, I've, I've told them at the end of the interview that I am going to call them, you know, a week from Monday if I haven't heard from them. So they know. And then a week from Monday when I call and if I get voicemail, I'm going to leave a message <sighs> telling them when I'm going to call again. So again, they know. Now I'm not going to say I'm going to call you in three hours i'm not going to call it you know i'm going to spread it out a little bit so that you know the first time i've scheduled it for after the um whatever the next steps are the next and so that's usually going to be a week or two out and then the next time i'm going to say it's okay for it to be a few days later because we're still right at that end but then after that it's, i'm going to make it more like um a week break and i'm going to look for what can i do other than just leaving a message that hey since we spoke i came across this resource that i thought might be really helpful to you oh i 
this relates exactly to something we were talking about in the interview, or I thought of something that might be helpful to you in evaluating my candidacy. So I'm going to find, try and find other things I can do other than just a message. But yeah, you, it, it, but it's a good thing to think about as to how I do it so that I'm not like a stalker. I, I had a colleague years ago who he had someone who was very interested in him. They had a great conversation. Guy said, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you. Um, let, let me, you know, take some time to think about it. The next day, Harvey called him back. And in the course of like a day and a half, he left the guy four messages. And after the fourth message, the guy said, never contact me again. So yeah, I don't want to do that. But I think setting expectations will do go a long way to avoiding that possibility. Great, thank you very much. Okay. All right, well, thank you everyone. I'm, I'm sure Frank will have a parting announcement in just a moment, but I wanna thank you all very much. John, thank you especially for continuing to be such a great supporter of Job Seekers and the Breakfast Club New Jersey. And just before we wrap up, I wanna let you know, we will be right back here again next month. It'll be Saturday, June 11th, bright and early at eight o'clock. Jennifer L. Smith will be here. I'm so glad Jennifer will be joining us. The passion factor, stand out and get noticed right away. So that's what she will be talking about. I think that's just very important, standing out, differentiating yourself from others. So I hope you are available uh, next month as well. By the way, you can check the Breakfast Club's website uh, on the menu calling about us. There's a link for speakers, and you can see all of our speakers scheduled through the end of this year. So please go ahead and check that out, because there may be a speaker or topic of interest that you want to make sure you don't miss. And so at least you can get that on your calendar as well. So just as we get ready to wrap up, uh, Frank, do you have a, a parting announcement you'd like to make? Uh, the only thing that I had as a takeaway in listening to uh, today's presentation, which John, I think was very spot on, is you know it's important for the interviewee to prepare, but not over-prepare so that their answers don't seem pre-rehearsed. Mm -hmm. But And that's a very fine line to walk. But it's also not to over-prepare to the point where you almost go into the interview with a, a an agenda in mind and y your listening skills um, fall down in that you're not really hearing things. You're You're just listening for buzzwords in order to go and give a response and sometimes it may not even be spot on to what the interviewer is asking so you know there's a delicate balance there of preparing and rehearsing versus you know the actual day of interacting and collaborating uh, with the interviewer and then the other thing that I would say is in listening to a lot of the questions that were raised you know I always like to think of Stephen Covey's approach of the seven habits of highly effective people. There's many things that may concern you in an interview, but there's a smaller subset of a circle within that of those things that you can influence. So don't get too hung up on those things that you're concerned about that you can influence because it, it, it's just you know a waste of time. You have to really focus on those things that you can influence. And when you put your energies there, you'll expand your circle of influence to the point where ultimately it'll cover your circle of concern. So try and use that Covey approach of the habits of highly effective people in order to make yourself more effective. But you know, just maintain your level of communicating and collaborating you know, try to leave the nerves at the door and, you know, look at the person there, you know, still in a professional capacity, but almost like a friend that you're there to have a, a, a conversation with and turn the interview into a conversation. That's really where the interview will, you, you'll shine in that interview because you're able to put both of you at ease, 
you're able to discuss the topic at hand and to really get to the bottom of it for both of you. And now more so than ever, after the great resignation and, you know, all of the complexities of COVID, you know, the supply and demand model is is more in favor than it's ever been on the employer candidate side. So, you know, you're interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you. So try and use that aspect of it. And uh, John, one thing that I would ask from you, uh, I don't know uh, how much you've gotten into the new hiring uh, and interviewing processes and all the information that's on Reddit and all for uh, candidates uh, and how to use Reddit in a uh, in a prep session for an interview. But I would love if you have a uh, presentation or any papers on that to share it with uh, the Breakfast Club members because I think many of our members, because they may be longer term workers, are not aware of uh, that as an avenue to help them prepare for a uh, a certain company or, you know, what that specific opportunity might be presenting to them in an interview process or a candidate process. And that's it for me, David. Terrific. Thanks very much. And I did for all of us, I did place John's contact information in the chat as well. And I'm sure John would have uh, uh, welcome a conversation offline from this as well. So uh, folks, thank you very much. Thank you for joining the Breakfast Club of New Jersey this month. Remember, you can see us again next month. We'll be here every second Saturday morning of the month. But until then, we'll simply say goodbye, have a good weekend, and we hope to all see you soon.